This is Julian speaking, welcoming you to another battle report out of the breach. The fate of Eric event has started. I am happy and proud to contribute to it with my battle reports. Remember to submit your games on your preferred social media platform and add the hashtag FateofEric to participate in the event and help to decide the fate of Eric. I have a few new things to introduce in this battle report, so let's get to it. phase of the event where we can use the Eric the Unsure version for our chosen faction without any upgrades. Bernd will try to convince Eric to see the green light of Leshavit and I will help him to remember his roots and guide his hand on his way to become the Commonwealth Knight he always wanted to be. Because we do not want to see two Erics bash their heads together, we decided to use him in an alternating fashion. This time, Eric the Unsure will fight on the side of the Commonwealth. Speaking of alternating things, this time you will see a troop selection used very commonly at most tournaments. Every player brings eight models to the table, and chooses five of them in an alternating fashion during the deployment. You have to think carefully about your collection of eight models. How do they interact with each other and with a tight or wide moonstone spread? And how do they interact with the different models and playstyles my opponent could bring? And then you do your fine-tuning at the table where you can see the chosen aid on the other side, the terrain, and last but not least, the moonstone drop. To keep things short, we will not discuss our troops in detail here, but I want to show the collection of aid and the deployment in more detail from now on to give you an overview of how it could work in a tournament. Here you see the aid models who are willing to fight for the Lesher Vault. And here the eight for the Commonwealth. And here you can see the depth of the Moonstones on the battlefield. The Lesher Vault choose to be the early bird and Mr. Toodles leads his friends with a happy tune into battle. For the Commonwealth, quack! is the first to spot a moonstone and runs right to it. Jada is maybe not so fond of Toodle's music and moves further away on the battlefield. But maybe she just spots a moonstone with her keen eye and wants to get there first. Because there is a cluster of stones, Kaufman gets close to see how worthy of his attention they are. Next to Jada, a frightening creature appears. Out of the deep woods, a Wendigo appears. And now, the hero of our story. 
Eric the Unsure is arriving next to Quack to help the weak old man harvesting some moonstones in a knightly manner. And Reagan raises an eyebrow while her eyes fall on the Wendigo, but she's surely here for some rituals. Gotchkat arrives to see that his well-paying customer Kaufmann is not harmed under his watch. Hoff arrives, and under the sound of his mighty hunting horn, Mr. Toodle's flute is not hurt anymore. So Toodle smirks, puts it in his backpack, and snaps his fingers to the sound of the hunt. Lastly, Marin Flintlock arrives and takes aim at the fawns in front of his friends, to protect them, whatever the cost. Turn 1. The Commonwealth have the initiative and hand the first activation to the Leshevold. And Mr. Toodles spends two energy to harvest the Moonstone because he's a weakling. He jogs, and because he carries a Moonstone, the jog is reduced to two inches. And then he spends his last energy to step once. Eric spends his three energy to harvest the stone down to a one and jogs forward. Jada jogs, harvests three times to pick up the stone and steps once. Quack is also a weakling and spends two energy to pick up the stone, jogs over to be in base contact with the other moonstone and spends his last energy targeting Flintlock with his foresight, to give him plus two on his arcane stat until the end of the turn. Reagan jogs and spends two energy to cast Verdant Growth, and declares a green too. The Commonwealth accept, and a wooded patch appears within eight inches. Flintlock spends one energy to harvest the stone down to a three, jogs to stand next to the crates, and takes aim to gain plus one on his arcane stat. He then fires his musket at Reagan. He has a base arcane of three, plus two for foresight, plus one for take aim, but Reagan is in heavy cover, so minus two. He can draw four cards and declares no card because he doesn't draw any green and with a bluff he would risk his musket on a catastrophe. Hoff jogs, steps twice and rests on one energy. Gotchgard harvests for two and jogs forward. The Wendigo steps once to be in base contact with the crates. Because he is sure-footed, he can spend just one energy to traverse and jogs forward and ends with his two energy left. Kaufmann harvests the stone down to a one, jogs to be in base contact with the other moonstone and spends two energy for his shower of gold. He declares a point within six inches, and every model within four inches of the chosen point moves two inches directly towards it. And after this action, Hoff declares a reaction step and moves in base contact with the moonstone. And that's the end of the first turn. I know Flintlock's damage is scary, and I could have tried to get a bluff through but we talked about it afterwards and Band had all green ones in hand. No catastrophe, but a called out bluff with a catastrophe costs Flintlock his powerful ranged tool. Turn 2. The 
Commonwealth wins the initiative and Gotchgut is the first to activate. With a fear of a mind control from the Wendigo on Gotchgut to hit Eric the Unsure, the giant jogs forward to engage the Wendigo. The Wendigo is swift because of Hoff's ability, Guerrilla Tactician, and spends one energy to move two inches. And Gotchgut rests on his two energy. Hoff jogs, spends one energy for a furious charge on Flintlock and moves three inches directly towards him. If Hoff's next action is a melee attack, he deals plus one damage. Gotchgut spends one energy for a reaction step to engage Hoff. Hoff attacks Flintlock and can draw five cards. He has a melee of four, plus two for the attack, and minus one because Gotchgut is also engaging him. Hoff plays two rising attacks and Flintlock two thrusts. Hoff can deal five wounds on Flintlock. Two for the rising attacks, plus two for the impact damage of his felling axe, and plus one for his furious charge. But Flintlock can deal five in return, four damage for the two thrusts, plus one for piercing damage from his dagger. That must be Hoff charging in and Flintlock in shock and surprise holds his dagger in front of him and Hoff crashing into him with deadly force. Hoff spends his last energy for another attack and Flintlock spends one energy to go for it to draw two more cards. Then the following happens. We think that Rising attack. Sweeping cut. Rising. Sweeping cut. Rising. Hoff can play three rising attacks and Flintlock three sweeping cuts. Hoff can deal eight damage and Flintlock six. That is more than enough and both of them are slain in a bloody mess. Quack spends two energy to harvest the moonstone, jogs and spends one to step once. The Wendigo jogs over to be in base contact with the moonstone and spends three energy to harvest the stone down to a one. Kaufman jogs and spends two energy to use his ability money back. It's a bit complicated, but bear with me. I'll try to explain what's happening. Kaufman can place a bag of gold token anywhere within six inches and line of sight. The token remains in play, but is removed if any model comes in base contact with it. Whenever another model, friend or foe, takes a jog or step action, while within six inches and line of sight of a bag of gold token, they may not end the move further away from the nearest bag of gold token than it began. Whew, that's a lot. But what does that mean exactly? No one can move away from the bag, except Kaufmann himself. But, there is a but. Everyone can circle around a bag of gold and a model can take a reaction step to get away from the bag. A complicated ability and I am not sure how to use it to full effect. I'm sorry. But we're all here to learn, so let's see what happens. Jada spends one energy for a reaction step to get behind the wooded patch to break line of sight to the money bag. The gold has no real value for her. She activates and jogs backwards and shoots her bow at Eric. With his evade of minus one, Jada can just draw three cards and declares a green one. 
the Commonwealth accepts and Eric would suffer X plus one piercing damage, but he wears his trusty leather jerkin to reduce the damage by one. So he suffers one wound. Eric the Unsure spends one energy to use his field medic on himself and declares a blue one. The Leshevold call bluff because there is no one else around to heal, so it's safe to call a bluff. But Eric is telling the truth and heals for one. He jogs and rests on his last two energy. Mr. Toodles jogs two inches and steps twice to get in base contact with the Moonstone. Gotchgut, Eric and Kaufmann take reaction steps. By the rules it would be Gotchgut after the jog, Eric after the first step and Kaufmann after the second step. It is important to talk to your opponent about what will happen next and see if there is a tricky situation where the precise timing of the reaction steps matter, but sometimes to keep the flow of the game you can declare your steps and handle them afterwards. As a general rule, just talk to your opponent. You're playing the game together, so do your best that everyone at the table is having a good time. Reagan spends three energy to use her Malachite ritual on Gotchgut and can draw seven cards. She declares a pink three and Gotchgut suffers three wounds because she can ignore passive abilities with her ritual. And Eric takes a reaction step. And that's the end of turn two. Will the Leshevold take the Moonstones and retreat back to the woods? Or will the Wendigo charge in to slice our beloved Eric into pieces? Who will be greedy and take Kaufmann's money back? And, most importantly, what is Mr. Toodle's newest goblin funk jazz tune about? You will discover all of that and more in the next turn. Commonwealth win the initiative and Gotchgut jogs over to the Wendigo. The Wendigo spends one energy to get within one inch to Gotchgut to be able to harm the giant with his attacks. And Gotchgut spends one to attack. He plays a rising attack and the Wendigo two fallen swings. Gotchgut upgrades into his signature move kick to the gods and can deal three wounds to the Wendigo. The Wendigo can deal seven damage to Gotchgut because he gains plus one melee damage and Gotchgut's armor is useless because all damage counts as magical. During the end step, the Wendigo loses one energy and is pushed one inch away from Gotchgut because of his kick to the gods. The Wendigo takes a reaction step to get back within one inch. And Gotchgut attacks again. The Wendigo spends his last energy to go for it. Gotchgut defends with a low guard and the Wendigo attacks with a sweeping cut and no damage is dealt. Mr. Toodles spends two for a healing on the Wendigo and declares a blue 2 to heal the Wendigo X plus 1. Because that would be enough to heal the Wendigo back to full wounds and there is no other wounded model around the Commonwealth call Bluff. He was telling the truth but doesn't want to put down another card. Eric the Unsure jogs to get within 2 inches of the Wendigo. That is in my opinion, one of the most powerful positions you can get to in Moonstone. 
If you have a model with a longer melee range than your opponent and the other model has no energy left, it is doomed to play just defensive cards and cannot step away, step in or go for it during the fight. Let's see what our squire gets out of it. Eric stays within 4 inches to Kaufmann. Because of his ability Champion, he gets plus 1 melee stat for every friendly soldier or noble within 4 inches. And he spends 1 energy for his first attack. Eric plays a rising attack and the Wendigo a low guard. The perfect counter, but Eric is out of his melee range and cannot be damaged by a follow-up attack. Another energy, another attack. Eric with two rising attacks against a high guard can deal five wounds because of his long sword. he gains another plus one on piercing or slicing damage. Eric uses his once per turn active ability <clears throat> your hero for zero energy and can make a melee attack without spending energy when there is a friendly soldier or noble within four inches. So to impress Kaufman and prove that he is worthy to be a knight, he attacks the Wendigo again. Eric plays two fallen swings against a low guard and can deal another five wounds and the Wendigo is slain. Jada jogs, steps once and shoots at Gotchgut. He gains light cover from the wooded patch and she declares a green too. The Commonwealth accept and Gotchgut suffers two wounds because his ramshackle armor can reduce the damage by one. Quack sees his wounded friend jogs and spends one energy for foresight to raise his arcane by two and spends two energy to heal Gotchgut. He declares a blue two and the Leshevold call bluff. But he was telling the truth. He declares a blue one and they call bluff again. But he was telling the truth. With Gotchgut healed by five wounds, he doesn't want to put down another card. Reagan jogs and steps once to engage Gotchgut and gets in base contact with a money bag to remove it. And Eric takes a reaction step. Reagan attacks Gotchgut. She plays a fallen swing and he plays a fallen swing. She can deal no damage. He can deal two because of his brute strength. And she attacks again. She defends Gotchgut's thrust with a sweeping cut. Her follow-up is a rising attack. It would deal one damage, but Gotchgut's ramshackle armor prevents that. No damage. Kaufmann jogs over to get closer to the precious moonstones and steps once. He drops a money bag in the middle to prevent the jazz fawn from fleeing. And that's the end of the turn. The Leshevold win the initiative and Mr. Toodles spends two energy to pick up the stone, jogs and steps to fight bravely for the moonstone. Gotchgut attacks Reagan. She spends one to go for it. Gotchgut plays a thrust against a high guard. He can deal two wounds on her and attacks again. Gotchgut with another thrust against her fallen swing, can deal enough damage and Reagan is slain. And he jogs to be in base contact with the Moonstone. Jada spends one to traverse the crates, jogs and steps twice. 
Eric jogs to get in base contact with the Moonstone and Jada spends her last energy for a reaction step. She can move two inches because she is engaged by Gotchgut and can deny Eric the harvest. Eric spends one energy to step away from Jada and uses your hero and attacks Mr. Toodles. Eric with a thrust against a low guard can deal two damage and Eric attacks again, this time with two thrusts, but Mr. Toodles counters with a sweeping cut. No damage. Last energy, last attack, Eric with two fallen swings against a thrust. Eric can deal one and Mr. Toodles can deal one. Not the heroic slaughter Eric was expecting. Quack spends two energy to pick up the Moonstone, jogs and spends one for foresight on Kaufmann. Kaufmann jogs over and spends one energy to make Jada a generous offer, to bribe the Moonstone of her and declares a pink too. The Leshevold call bluff, but he was telling the truth and Kaufmann gains possession of the stone. And that's the end of the game. What a game! Hoff charging into Flintlock very early still seemed a good idea, but Flintlock just got the right cards to take Hoff with him. It definitely stopped the ranged threat, but the plan was to have Hoff a bit longer in the enemy lines. What you couldn't see but maybe feel was the permanent threat of the Wendigo using his mind control. For three energy he can use Flintlock to shoot or Gotchgut or Eric for example to attack someone in their melee range. Both with two inches engagement range gave me the task to be very careful with the positioning and the activation order of my troop. You have to respect that ability and play around it. I am still not sure what to do with Kaufmann and his money bags. I think he's a model that needs a lot of practice because you can hinder your own models with the bags. Shower of gold is nice and the generous offer is a good trick to take some stones of an enemy model without the risk of melee combat and one of the few ways of taking moonstones of friendly models. Jada did impressive movement, especially a dance around Gotchgut. Swift as reaction step is a nice thing to see. Swift is not always a tool to get away from your opponent. Maybe she would have been better placed on the other side where the two stones were because with her being non-weakling and having four energy, she can harvest a lot and is still mobile enough to get around. Maybe I should play her myself one day. She can at least work for the Commonwealth. Never mind. I hope you enjoyed the event kickoff game from our side. If you cannot get enough of Moonstone, check out Paolo's YouTube channel. He is recording games on the Tabletop Simulator and is doing live streams on Twitch. You find an awesome variety of troops and battle reports on his channel. Or check out the legend himself, Daniel, from Ye Oldy Battle Raps. He's doing Moonstone video battle reports since the beginning of time and he is also a host of the wonderful Moonstone podcast. I am definitely guilty of listening to some episodes more than once. Entertaining and very informative. And check out Joe's blog, where you can find articles of different Moonstone topics. He is also organizing the Mischief and Mayhem tournament in Bristol at the end of August. All the links in the description down below. And you know what you can do to help the channel. Like, share, comment and subscribe. But most importantly, I want to thank you for watching. I will paint up some minis, edit more footage and hope 
to see you soon for another battle report out of the breach. Thank you.